What does a patient with Parkinson's look like? Sound like? What common traits do they share? Well, some create music, write poetry, some even capture the world and its beauty on a canvas. Art is unique, hence artists are unique individuals. Individuals living with a diagnosis of Parkinson's. So what do these individuals look and sound like? Well, see and hear for yourself. Art needs a home. Maybe here in this poem. Find a refuge, an ark, a safe place to park. Then boldly go forth. Or why not go first? What's the worst that could happen? Zombies. That project developed as a, a wonderful circumstances that I have in my life, which is that I live with my uh, grandchildren and we often take walks and they're uh, in the range of five years old. So they move at a pace that's pretty close to mine, uh, my new pace. And every now and then, as we take our long walks, I find these really beautiful things that are that I don't think I would ordinarily have noticed. So I ha happened upon this um, glade, and I just hit it perfectly. I recognize the symmetry of the design and the sort of nakedness of the trees, uh, the kind of purity of the setting and the stillness of the water. I thought, uh, this is really amazing. Be bemused, be absurd, then boldly go third. Make mischief, make rhymes. In these fear addled times, we know art can save us, but who will save art? When I wrote it, I was thinking about immigration and how tough it is on the families and so forth, and the music sounds to me like waves going up and down. I couldn't tell the story with just the music. It wasn't effective enough. If I have to tell somebody that it sounds like waves, then the hearing of it alone is not enough to tell the story, but I wanted to tell the story of what I was feeling when I wrote it. Art needs a hero, a champion, a spark, and a spark needs a sidekick. We'll call it the Ark. Well, I was in the Navy, so I used to watch water all the time. A lot of the paintings I do, if I look at any part of the painting, I'm trying to express the movement of the water in that particular spot. It's actually kind of hypnotic, you know, the way these waves happen and try to capture that in the painting. Well, I saw these leaves that were um, half like normal and half diseased and they were really interesting looking. And I started looking at them more closely and I thought, this is like how I feel, like part of me is diseased and part isn't. Um, so it seemed not exactly the same, but enough that I felt I could write something about it to connect it with my experience. Quick, follow that spark. It might conjure magic in moods or in masks, comedic and tragic. What powers the spark? Ecstatic electricity and occasional jolts from lightning bolts, just to add eccentricity. I got interested in Car Carol Appel, who's a Norwegian artist who died about 10 years ago. I, I don't know why, but if I see something I like, I try and copy it. The colors, the primary colors, uh, I think attracted me because I, I, that's, that's really what I enjoy. I get a real splash out of that. Then follow that arc, but take care you don't lose your way in the dark and roll over Beethoven, scuffing his blue suede shoes. Nitro uh, 
is with uh, Conrad Weir, who's a leader of the band Beast of Lux. And he composed that song. He submitted it to me and he said, um, I want you to make it sound good. He, he got this, this drummer named Poogie Bell to play drums. Poogie Bell plays drums with, uh, with the Houston, David Bowie, that level of drummer. And he, he submitted a drum track. He asked me to do something with it. And the song was just a, a guitar and, and his voice and Poogie's drums. So I worked on it and um, it's, it's what I like to do. I like to take an idea and run with it. The arc, so they say, began as a spark whose narrative needed to grow like Noah's Ark did. I don't mean the boat. I'm speaking of Noah's rainbow. Brain comes from a brain scan that my neurologist put it back in December. I became just totally fascinated with the, the idea of slices of my brain, you know, because Parkinson's is a neuromuscular disease and it's caused by, primarily by the brain. Um, so I had never thought of my brain really before I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, but now I think about my brain all the time. So I wanted to use those slices of my brain in my artwork. And I felt like I was dying and colleagues, friends of mine, they were all kind of moving along in their profession. We're all psychotherapists. It's what I do for work. I couldn't think straight. So that was me. I was, I felt like the fish. That fish captured me on a dry riverbed. It was a very painful place to be. And then I had a sister die of COVID. And then I became part of the, part of the birds. You know, it's like, I wasn't dying. I didn't know what was going on. What's the worst that could happen? Not zombies, exactly, nor describing a deficit, matter-of-factly. Dopamine, obviously, because we're all on dopamine. It's kind of the savior of people with Parkinson's. It's still the same basic drug that I used for 50 years. And I saw a dopamine neuron in a newspaper. I saw a picture of an actual neuron. And I looked at it and I thought, well, it's interesting, it's kind of like a flower in a way. Maybe losing a spark that you used to rely on, like missing a star from the belt of Orion, until you remember your knack for star making, a craft that looks easy but is really painstaking. And what if more stars should fall off the belt? Replace them, restore them, suture yourself, so is art just a surgical workaround? Or the art of completing your own genome while letting a spark lead the way back home? The first place I ever really painted was in Spain. And when I arrived the first day and I was jet lagged at three in the morning, I started reading about flamenco because I knew I wanted to go see it. And flamenco is they say when it's really great, it has duende, which means incredible expression and emotion and authenticity. So I hope in listening to it, it imbues some of that into my art. When I was working, I used to commute long distances. And when I went out in the morning, I always had my camera with me because we had wetlands in the back of our house at the time. And it was just beautiful. It was really the lights changing and everything else. There's a yellow barn in the distance. And that thing had a billion shades of yellow. It taught me to like look for those yellows, gold and white and, and yellow and bright. And at the same time, there's this muted sense of it that was sort of like dark and sort of, sort of cool. So it was one of those things that you liked what was going on, but you could put your finger on it. We're tracking a spark, but it hasn't gone far like those moonbeams we once carried home in a jar when we were invited to swing on a star, which might be a little like flinging a spark and turning it into a story's arc. Art needs a good home, a good place to park. Make a light in the dark. Make a light from the dark. California 
fires burn in the beautiful state where I was born, and I mourn the loss of the green and the golden. I'm so upset about climate change being ignored. I mean, now they actually say that phrase on the news, climate change. When I wrote that song, it was never said on the news. Every year for the last few years, they're saying it's the worst fire season ever. And when you think about how many hundred-year storms have we been having, like we have a hundred-year storm every year now. So um, I was just PO'd, and so that's why California burning. the green and the golden California's burning the beautiful state where I was born and I mourn the loss of the green and the golden